senses language in two ways. First, the experience of intense pain escapes language and is most often expressed in pri primordial sounds, sounds that we knew before we could form words. Secondly, the discussion of pain, especially that of extreme suffering, silences other conversation. Scary comments, quote, one of two things is true of pain. Either it remains inarticulate, or the moment it first becomes articulate, it silences all else. The moment language bodies forth the reality of pain, it makes all further statements and interpretations seem ludicrous and inappropriate as hollow as the world content that disappears in the head of the person suffering. Beside the initial fact of pain, all further elaborations, all these seem trivializations, a missing of the point, a missing the pain. But the result of this is that the moment it is lifted, lifted out of the ironclad privacy of the body into speech, it immediately falls back in." End quote. And Invisible in part because of its resistance to language, it is also invisible because of its own powerfulness, which ensures its isolation, ensures that it will not be seen in the context of other events, and that it will fall back from its new arrival into language and remain devastating. Its absolute claim for acknowledgement contributes to pain being ultimately unacknowledged. As such, extreme pain is isolation. But is this the same as Kaivalya? Isolation and objectless pain give rise to imagination. The Yoga Sutras offer a lively discussion of what takes place through the accomplishment of Samyama, the culmination of the final three limbs of Patanjali's eight limbs. Indeed, Sutra 337 suggests a polarity between the fantastic effects of Samyama and a quiet detachment from these effects, Samadhi. Thus, ultimate perfection in the Yoga Sutras means not giving in to the effects, imagined or real, of absorbed concentration. Imagination is the perfect counterpart to pain. While pain is, rec in that, while pain is recognized as unique for being wholly without objects, imagination is equally distinct as an experience made up entirely of objects. Imagination is nothing without the objects that form its content. content. Unlike hunger, sight, etc., which connect the body to concrete objects, imagination is pure objectivity. Skari remarks, any state that was permanently objectless would no doubt begin the process of invention. End quote. However, in most contexts, the relationship between pain and imagination is anything but simplistic and direct. As such, pain may be the most elemental experience within our existence and imagination represents its rationalization. Further, the silence surrounding pain is contrasted by the elaborate and ready discourse we have regarding power. In this, the Yoga Sutras, in the Yoga Sutras, this point might be illustrated by the numerous examples of achievement and power in relation to yogic practice and the relatively subtle, even silent place of Kaivalya. In this line, Skari suggests that the very fact of occurring easily in human speech increases the domain of power and our ability to relate to it. Skari explains, pain and imagination are the framing events within whose boundaries all other perceptual, somatic, and emotional events occur. Thus, between the two extremes can be mapped the whole terrain of the human psyche. End quote. As such, while pain represents the process of unmaking, imagination allows for continuous making and recreation. The objectlessness and isolation associated with pain allows for a reconstruction of the self. In the case of torture, this recreation of self occurs within the domain of power that is orchestrated by the torturer. The person, precisely through his or her own perceived experience of self-betrayal, and finally, self-annihilation becomes the instrument of the regime or, political or the political entity that authorizes the torture. In the incidence of extreme trauma, this reconstruction of self in relation to the traumatic event threatens the individual's ability to be autonomous, often leading to depression or addiction. A recent BBC special investigates 
quote, how extreme isolation warps the mind. Among other difficulties, one of the most commonly reported results of extreme isolation, both in antidote and in carefully monitored experiments, is hallucination. A key feature of this article is a consideration of the various coping skills that contribute to the individual's ability to endure isolation. One such skill is the ability to transcend the reality of the situation. Naturally, this occurs differently within different contexts. However, a prime example of transcending reality was the imagination or projection of the self outside of the immediate body. For mountaineers, this might be experienced as identifying more wholly with the natural world and its immense grandeur. Evidence of lost sailors suggests that this may explain the tendency to create an imaginary partner. In these examples, the imagination provided the necessary coping skills to withstand the isolation. Furthermore, the study highlights the importance of intention and purpose. Individuals aligned with a higher purpose were more able to withstand the isolation and avoid madness or suicide. In the process of yoga, apart from any modern context or practice, the particular understanding of kaivalya samadhi may offer the possibility to transcend isolation. Kaivalya, with its lucidity, purity, and discriminative, discriminative insight must be something better than the isolation which leads to madness. Conclusion. Perhaps the best response to the comparison I have set up between extreme trauma and samadhi kaivalya is 4.1 of the Yoga Sutras. Perfections are born due to birth, drugs, mantra, austerity, or samadhi. Thus, the states of consciousness described in the Yoga Sutras are attainable through various means. The distinction is then made in 4.6, there, what is born of meditation is without residue. This, distingui this distinguishes the practice of dhyana, meditation, from the other means that give rise to siddhi, samadhi, and kaivalya. However, we are still li left with the need to articulate a contemporary understanding of Siddhi, Samadhi, and Kaivalya in ways that accurately represent Dhyana without residue, Anashayam. In my opinion, evidence regarding the efficacy of yoga practice for healing places a new demand on the way we art articulate the classical goals of yoga. While not all scholars will agree that yoga therapy is related to or dependent upon yoga philosophy, most will agree that yoga should not be confused with extreme trauma or torture. <laughs> Maybe that's up for debate. Over the past 10 to 20 years, there's been a lively academic discussion regarding the interpretation of samadhi and kaivalya as either ultimately integrative or entirely disintegrative or world renouncing. Is yoga union and does the ultimate state allow for purified action within the world? Or conversely, is yoga disunion, and the ultimate state represent the end of action entirely? Following the work of Stuart Sarbacher, I read the Yoga Sutras as integrating the dialectical tensions of attachment and detachment, of achievement and detachment. Thus, while, in, while Pada 1 and 4 highlight the withdrawal process of samadhi and kaivalya, Padas 2 and 3 acknowledge practice and achievement through the discussion of sadhana and siddhi. This position, while we're not rejecting the possibility of purified action in the world, ultimately acknowledges the centrality of detachment. As such, in my reading of the text, I recall Daniel Ravi's entertaining introduction to exploring the Yoga Sutras regarding translation. Translation, interpretation, even appropriation is necessary to engage with the text like the Yoga Sutras, that is separated from our contemporary context by time, culture, and language. Yet even with translation, interpretation, and appropriation, we must also strive to allow the text to be foreign, abstract, uncomfortable. In my comparison between extreme trauma and the state of Kaivalya, I aim to renew old questions. What is the relevance of Kaivalya for contemporary yoga practice? And similarly, what can the contemporary experience of yoga teach us regarding our approach 
to interpretation and translation. Mental focus is central for Patanjali. For Skari, it is the destruction of mental focus, or the elimination of the possibility of focusing on anything other than the experience of pain that causes the shift of consciousness. Thus, I wonder, in a process that attempts to eliminate the I, is there really any difference? Unlike the objectless awareness that results from extreme trauma, Kaivalya entails lucidity. Torture obliterates and obfuscates the consciousness through the induction of ob objectless awareness. Yoga is the process of refining consciousness and the gradual practice of detachment which allows for pure awareness. In my own work, I want to emphasize the radical alterity of, conce of the concepts of samadhi and kaivalya. <clears throat> Perhaps more than any other concept in the Yoga Sutras, these need to be allowed to remain other, undomesticated by our attempts to soften and understand them within our utterly attached and materialistic world. Nonetheless, giving due attention to these concepts may give contemporary readers reason to read the rest of the Yoga Sutra with greater awareness and appreciation for the various processes that are set forth within the text. Yoga is clearly a practice that is directed to increasing focus. However, at what expense? What does a powerful ability to focus look like? Allowing the strangeness of Kaivalya to remain other also entails caution. Indeed, Kaivalya is not a synonym for heaven yet neither should it be interpreted as hell. Mm. Oh, that was a great paper. Um, very wonderful after you know, empathy to experience of pain. And I think it's very interesting. I have had myself experience of pain. I'm looking forward to reading your work. And something happens, something very detached, some kind of detachment, some kind of focus happens when you have a really hard, sharp experience of pain. So I, I think it's very interesting work, but you are trying to um, very, very, very creative. So thank you so much. We'll take a few questions. Um, Okay, first. Excuse me. Uh, having been one who has experienced in Ken's pain and injury, would you agree that what we're talking about with Kaivalya and pain? is purely an issue that it is only experiential. You can't explain it to anybody else. Can you repeat that? I'm not sure if I fully... And the, the idea of reaching Kavalya, let's say, and staying alive, um, is can only really be done ex through experience. You can experience it, but you can't really explain it to anybody else. Okay. And what I'm suggesting is that's true also of intense pain. Yes. Okay, that's so. Would you agree with that? Yeah, is what I'm saying. Yes, I would agree with that. I think that there's a an inexpressibility to both, which allows for, perhaps it, perhaps it is the inexpressibility of the experience that allows for Kaivalya to happen. In the case of pain, there may be less of a voluntary. Maybe neither are voluntary, I don't know. Maybe both are occurrences as a result of practice or um, accident. Thanks a lot for your fascinating, fascinating talk. Just two comments on the re relationship between pain and yoga. On the one hand, we have the concept of tapas, which is self-inflicted pain, which plays a certain role uh, in yoga. And this is something maybe you could look at, how much 
self-inflicted pain is uh, admissible or positively uh, valued in the Patanjali Yoga Shastra, and where are the um, the boundaries of what is uh, acceptable. Also, the um, Patanjali Yoga Shastra itself says that it should be practiced as long as it does not affect the clarity of the mind. So that's one thing. And the other comment uh, concerns to your question whether pain could be seen as a kind of uh, objectless uh, samadhi. And from the perspective of yoga, of course, this is not the case, because uh, everything which is a consciousness contained uh, is part of the citta. Uh, and is displayed in the citta to the Purusha, who is uh, um, the instance of, of clear and pure awareness without any content. And uh, the experience of asam pragnata samadhi would amount to some kind of self-realization of this uh, consciousness without consciousness content. So as long as we are dealing with consciousness content, we are uh, um, on, on the side of not uh, um, speci specifically <laughs> yogic states of mind. Consciousness content, do you mean um, that if you're experiencing the pain, then you have content in, within your consciousness? That Absolutely. Yeah. Any form of uh, awareness which... Uh, I mean, this, this uh, yoga uh, ontology is based on, on this dualism between Purusha and Prakriti, and uh, the mind chitta is part of this Prakriti, and uh, also the whole... Um, mental capacity, uh, the senses, uh, everything with which we uh, are related to the, uh, to the outside world. This is uh, made out of um, prakriti, uh, out of matter. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Purusha is uh, able to just witness what is happening in the citta, that is, in the mental capacity. Everything which uh, is, uh, every kind of content which um, figures in, in the citta is shown to the Purusha. And as long as this process um, is uh, happening, the Purusha identifies with the content of consciousness and does not realize its own uh, nature. And this is seen as uh, avidya, as a wrong kind of knowledge. And the aim of yoga would be to end this wrong identification between the Purusha and the Chitta. So um, that w w which happens, it's very difficult uh, to put it in words, and uh, this is... Uh, of course, uh, the problem which every mystical um, tradition has. Mm, the, I think the, the metaphor which one could use would be a kind of consciousness bare of any consciousness content. So just abstract consciousness. Uh, this is how one could maybe describe uh, the aim of, of Kalvarya. So. Although I think that the argument that's made within the analysis of extreme trauma is that it erases the, the content. That there is an era that there is a, there becomes a certain as a coping mechanism to deal with the circumstances. That an ability to even conceive of what is happening is erased in the incident of well, it's happening. So uh, the pain is still there as a form of content. it's suppressed. Mm -hmm. It's suppressed. It's suppressed. It's not transcended. It's suppressed. Suppressed. Right. It's a difference. Right. right. Yeah. No, that's important. And, and there is also a distinction between one-pointedness that is always inherent in even our, our, all of our mistaken cognitions, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, right? I mean, uh, the, the, uh, in the Yoga Sutras, we, I think we have to distinguish one-pointedness um, from this kind of uh, consciousness without content or non-intentional consciousness. And, and you know, so there's one-pointedness even a, in our most utter distraction in a strange way. That's there. So um, maybe pain, I don't know. Maybe that connects to this issue of mm -hmm. the one pointedness of pain as opposed to the transcendent or, or um, contentness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, following on at both of these points, looking at it through the lens of the klishtas. So avidya is a klishta, but also vesha, which is that dukkana shayi, that dwelling upon the pain. And so just as one might go back again and again for for something that's pleasing, what's some what's sukha? You know, this tea is very sukha. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep going back for more. So too an object of pain can actually cause a cyclical process of going back and visiting that pain over and over and over and over again. So so I mean I think looking at the Klishta of Devesha would be I think a very fruitful thing in connection with this. 
The other thing, too, on the, the issue of Kaivalya is there is, you know, discussion in the Bhashya of being in a sort of false Kaivalya, that the, you know, the Baba Pratyayos, the uh, beings that are basically emerging back into primordial prakriti, but are not actually reaching Kaivalya, and I think, and, and Phil could probably speak to this more at length, entering into a state like Kaivalya, but then re-emerging from it again later. So, a sort of state that is like that Kaivalya, but, but isn't it. And the Buddhists are very interested in this as well. In fact, that's one of the critiques they level on the, the Hindu yogis, is that the Hindu yogis think they're achieving enlightenment or, or nirvana, but what they're doing is temporarily suppressing their afflictions, and then those afflictions are just going to be manifesting later. Uh, it seems that, you know, Patanjali and or Vyasa was also recognizing that some people may enter a state that they believe is actually Kaivalya, but in fact they reemerge and the, the klishas reactivate afterwards. Much has already been addressed after I raised my hand. Um, I think what where we are missing is like in applying these terminologies of intentionality. I was also struggling with the same terms. Um, three approaches need to be clearly distinguished between psychological, cognitive, and phenomenological. Um, uh, for the cognitivist, um, emotions are propositional. And uh, for the uh, phenomenologist, uh, uh, you would have intentionality. But I don't think that uh, the psychological approach, at least the behavioral psychology, does not uh, address them in any of those terms. So if we ground there, and I just come to Philip, what he just said, um, just not having intentionality does not make them equal. Um, and how do we distinguish them is not based on what goes during that period, but uh, whether that constitutes some skara, as Eastwood just said. And like in Sushupti, we do not have any visha other than Avidya, but we know that there are different types of Sushupti, as uh, Patanjali Vyasa talk about. We dukkham aswapsam, sukham aswapsam, all, all the sleep states are not identical because sometimes we wake up very tired uh, uh, and, and sometimes we are very light. Thank you. Could, could, I, just make, could I make one quick? Sure. Um, the, the issue of pain and uh, dukkha, which understood as frustration. I think we have to discern a slight difference between dukkha and pain in some way. Yeah. In that dukkha is our reaction to pain. It, it's what the eye does with the pain. Or what the eye does with the pleasure. The sukha. Right? So you get the attachment, you get dvesha, raga dvesha. So there's so much in this klesha doctrine that needs to be yet unraveled about human identity and the integrity of life that comes through the context of klesha. So, I mean, samadhi is a state that is present to all states of mind. As Vyasa says in 1.1, 1 1, it's present. You can have samadhi-like experiences through very negative states of mind, but it's not samadhi. It, it, and it can become very attractive especially in the Vikshipta, sort of where you get temporary, enheightened, pleasurable, even mystical experiences that you can become attached to. Anyway, I don't want to go on. But, but there's a lot here, so you're on to... Uh, you know, there, there are, we have to discern subtle differences, and maybe Chris will speak to this tomorrow, but the, the doctrine of subtilization in yoga really unleashes a lot of wisdom about what is really going on in yoga and, and how freedom comes through this subtilization process, purification, illumination of the chitta. Anyway.
just take two more questions and then we'll move on. Uh, um, I wanted to think with you this phenomenology of pain in the examples that you give with accident, abuse, um, trauma, or torture. And you characterize them as being pain that goes beyond the control of the ego. And then pose the question whether that, um, well, you develop that point and pose, it, pose the question about being that samadhi. But my, my question to you is, um, even though the process to samadhi is also a process of going beyond the ego, it seems to me that there is the phenomenological difference that going beyond the ego in samadhi doesn't necessarily uh, take you to powerlessness, whereas in pain, going beyond the ego in pain, there is this sense of being powerless. And so, that's something else to explore. Because in uh, Kaivalya, which is translated as isolation, there is also this sense that you experience chitti shakti. So there is this power of consciousness that doesn't seem to be there in, in the absorption of pain. Yeah. No, I agree completely. And I think it's probably not expressed clearly enough in the paper, but I think by comparing it to the power experiences of the third pada, which may be morally ambiguous, it's argued at times, but they um, don't come across as being painful to the one who is experiencing them. It's kind of morally ambiguous what that individual does with the experience of power. But they come to power through, you know, through focus and extreme concentration. So I think that's a stark con contrast to, to the other. It's, um, and I think part of, part of what I want to do is to highlight that. Thank you. That was a magnificent paper. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, offer two kinds of pain that we see medically, generally in life. One is a kind of pain that one knows is going to go away. And one is a kind of pain that one is not sure is going to go away and produces anxiety. And that factor, anxiety, probably should be brought in into one's reaction to the pain. Uh, if I may offer, the kind of pain that would go away is labor pains. And uh, labor pains, I doubt if there's one woman in this world who remembers it. Otherwise, there would not be a population. <laughs> But on the other hand, there's another kind of pain that one knows will not go away. But there is even one more kind where one imagines that the pain is going to cause a problem, and that's the anxiety. And if I may offer, would you think that yoga helps in reducing anxiety to pain? Thank you so much. Thank you for and the great comments. I appreciate it. We will have more time for questions afterwards. So thank you so much. Let's do it. Our next speaker um, is uh, Professor Johan Grishpa uh, and his Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And his presentation title is The Siddhis and Philosophical Exercise in the Yoga Sutra. Thank you. Uh, in, uh, I mean, this morning, my, my wife uh, told me something like that. To be in the center is good. <laughs> to be in the center is good. Yes. <laughs> to be in the center is good. Yes. <laughs> uh, my wife told me this morning that there is no uh, milk in the fridge. 
So, grammatically, it is a statement of fact, yes. But is it all? And I would like to say some things beyond grammar a little bit. Uh, I agree with Philip that uh, grammar does matter a lot. And, uh, but um, there is also um, some dimensions of speech, which I refer to as dimensions of the speech act, as I think relevant for our encounter with the Yoga Sutra. For you, you, you can ask yourself, when Patanjali says, Yoga Rodaha, Yoga is a cessation of mind vibrations, what actually does he say? What does he do? What does he do? When we think of a tradition combining practice and theory in such an intimate way, it is not an irrelevant question, I mean, to, to ask for a text. What does he do? What, what does he want, actually? Patanjali saying all this, does he want to inform us, just saying that uh, there is no milk in the fridge? When my wife said, to that, said that to me, I was 100% sure she wanted to say, you should go and bring some it's not, I mean, it, it happens a lot in life. There's all sorts of apparently innocent uh, statements of facts are not exactly only matters of, matter of facts. But you agree with me that you, you laugh. You're laughing because you know it's true. So what about now, uh, what about Patanjali? Um, actually, what I would like to say, I, just to remind me if I'm, I'm just going to skip some things, I would like to speak about, to talk about the cities, the imagination in Patanjali's sense, which is Bhavana, which is not imagination, but it is Bhavana. So actually the title of my presentation should be um, uh, The Yoga Sutra as an Exercise of Bhavana. Bhavana is make be make something, make be. The root is, of course, who, and the Havana is make something to be. Which is, this is a, a this is the Yoga Sutra a notion of so-called imagination, which is very, very bad. It's a very bad translation, but what can we do? If you have any other uh, concept, I would be happy to, to, to hear, but that's it, what they say, Bhavana, is imagination, but imagination in the sense which I will clear out a little bit later. Now, I would like, my starting point is, point is the cities. It's uh, already a long time since I was uh, sort of very much interested in the question of what the cities are. When I first came to the University of Pennsylvania to, uh, to write my PhD dissertation under Wilhelm Halfas, and I I told him that I was I was interested, I was curious about the cities because there was so much denigration, so much so much belittling of the powers. Even our Kevin today said that, that referred to Yoga Sutra three thirty seven as a sutra which uh, which recommends uh, letting go of the cities, right? Even he said Kevin said they must go away in order that, and this is very common. And, and as I read the Yoga Sutra, I really wondered about it. It was very interesting for me, to, the question as to, as to what do the cities do there? Actually, why is it such a big, um, you know, such a, a big volume of the Yoga Sutra deals with, with the cities? It's a question. And reading the commentaries, I mean, the scholarly, uh, scholarly translations and commentaries on, on the Yoga Sutra, I found out that indeed the secret cities are a very bad name, and it, it makes the cities, the, the uh, Patanjali theory of the, of the cities, uh, made so many you know, people uncomfortable. Some, some of them were very harsh. For example, the great uh, Max Miller. Max Miller said uh, the cities, the teaching of the cities, is uh, due is, is only for of interest for a pathologist, not for any serious person or philosopher. But that's not so important because, after all, you are all yoga practitioners. Max Miller also said that all these postures and tortures. So, and with the cities, <laughs> but, but, but the cities, the cities were even worse. And he said maybe there are two Patanjali's. One Patanjali is the great philosopher who writes about the uh, distinction of. Purusha and Prakriti, and the other one that speaks about the cities, I don't know why. And if you look at the, at the scholarly commentaries uh, on the cities, 
You see that uh, it is uh, all of the weather, obstacles to liberation, to Calvary, Calvary or whatever, or just, you know, a foolish kind of uh, megalomaniac uh, kind of uh, fantasies. The cities were invariably, almost, almost invariably uh, denigrated as worthless, as obstacles, as, as even ethically uh, bad. But it, the, still, the question is, the intellectually, what are they? And then I faced, just lately I started to think again of the cities, only lately. Because when I composed my dissertation under Harpas, he asked me, what is the title of your dissertation? And I said, just, I said, the role and the meaning of Samyama and the cities in the Yoga Sutra. He said, oh, well, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> but, but, but he also said, we better start reading the Sadhana Pada, mm -hmm. not the Bhikkhuti Pada, the Sadhana Pada. This is more philosophically interesting. And yet, the cities are of interest. Really, such a, and lately I started mm -hmm. thinking of the scope of the cities. I think that the cities are not only the Bhikkhuti Pada, of course. The cities are, the, oh, every Yama and every Niyama is of a certain result, a city result, yes, right? The city is out. And you see, it's, it goes in the, in the, everywhere actually in the Yoga so The scope of the city is not only one quarter, as people think sometimes, but it is almost half. And then when I say, now, I say something which is uh, in fact uh, maybe far fetched, the teaching, of the Yoga Sutra is the teaching of the cities in entirety. Even, even Philip Mas. Sutra. Sira uh, Suttam <laughs> Asanam is actually a kind of a city. It invites some kind of, it is an achievement. And this is a flavor which is not in the text, it's not in the grammar, but you have to actually make it there, I think. Even such a practical and matter of fact sutra like Stila Sukama Asanam is a kind of a city, and then if you read it like that, you see that all through the Yoga Sutra, the scope of the series is so much bigger than I have ever thought, and I think this is everything is a city. That just even the Viveka, the Viveka, the ultimate uh, discrimination of subject and object, of Purusha and Pragati, even Viveka is a kind of a city is a kind of an achievement, is an entertainment. So I think the power, the word power is not, is not okay. But what I think is that uh, when you see, when you look into Vyasa's and uh, Vashaspati's uh, commentaries uh, on the Yoga Sutra, you see that the city is a sutra, it's a sign. And Vashaspati says the, the city is a, what he called the, the yogin who, who uh, reads of the, who, who knows of the city, he knows whether he is a Kretakarya or not. Kretakarya, when he has, com has completed, he, whether he completed his, his way of development or not. Now, this is very important, I think, even logically. It's a suchaka, it's something which is, has its logical kind of a status. Because if it does not happen, it means that the yogin, according to, you know, the yogin is not on his way. I mean, it's, uh, if you, you think about the suchaka, it's a sign, and according to logic uh, modus ponens kind of uh, rule, if P and Q, then Q, if not Q, then not P. So, you see, maybe the series are extremely important for the sutrakara's uh, mind, for Patanjali, the series, the notion of the series, and I think, uh, then I think how, what to do with the series. When once upon a time I wrote about the cities, I thought I tried to to um, say something against Max Müller and allies, etc. I, <laughs> I I wanted to to salvage, the, to redeem the cities from non significance, and I thought of them as experiences, and I thought of experiences, and yet you know it seems a little bit stupid the cities. Because you say by you say by by uh, certain when when samyama on the boundary of body and space let's say and you know samyama on the lightness of a cotton piece 
then levitation is possible. Levitation occurs. But no one sees uh, levitating persons. And then you think it's either false or what is it? Even as experiences, you see, I experience myself as levitating, it's difficult. It's difficult. It, it, the experience of levitation is difficult. And then I, I, I've come across the notion of bhavana. Bhavana, and I think it's only for me in the last two months or two, so I'm not an expert on that, but I've read David Schulman's uh, wonderful book called More Than Real, the history of the, a history of the imagination in South India. This is a great book. And he says Bhavana, Bhavana is imagination. And Bhavana is imagination which causes to be, which is effective, which is effective, Almost by definition, called Bhavana, Bhavana. Then I looked in, into all sorts of uh, books which, where, where Bhavana is dealt with. It's, it's, a, it's a big subject matter which I, I do not master of so far. But uh, Bhavana, then I looked into the Yoga Sutra. There are seven sutras, I think, where Bhavana is, is um, explicitly mentioned in the sutra, in the sutra letter. Yes? And then, and then I think, well, bhavana was not a concept foreign to the sutrakar's mind. It was not foreign. You see, for example, you see, uh, I just uh, happened to type some, look, for example, 128, yes, tad japas tad artha bhavanam, bhavanam. Remember, the, the root is bhu, the root is bhu, is bhavana is make be. Uh, it is not imagination. Scholars were afraid of the concept of imagination. Because imagination sounds as, you know, associated with mere fantasy, hallucination, daydreaming, something like that. something purely mental. It is something, but this is not imagination in the Yoga Sutra. Avana is something else. And we'll have to think about it, what Avana means. But you see, tad japas tad artha bhavana. Now I see, look at uh, Hari Harananda Aranya's translation. He says, repeat it and contemplate upon its meaning, about the Om. Contemplate of the Om. Contemplate, he doesn't say imagine anything. He says, contemplate. Then uh, Ukmani says, the repetition of it, Om, and meditating on Ishvara, which is its meaning, should be done. She, she adds, should be done. It's a statement of fact, but she said she brings into her reading of the Yoga Sutra, as everyone does, the prescriptive dimension, which is not there, because it's always statements of fact, so grammatically all of them, all of them. Though Vyasa indeed says very often, Hava yet, it, it makes, makes being, makes into, into it makes being, but Patanjali never does that. And, uh, but all, all translations of Bhavana, I can bring some, some else, but it's uh, a little bit, uh, uh, you see that there are seven sutras of Bhavana, it's always contemplation, cultivation, uh, thought, thinking, thinking, you see, in order to, in order to, uh, you see, for example, I tell you another, Vitarka Bhadhane Pratipaksha Bhavana, in order to, uh, to uh, what to say, in order to negate uh, evil or evil uh, streams of, of, of evil moods, and he means especially the yamas and the niyamas, whatever goes against them, in order to, to oppose this, Pratipaksha Bhavana, there is Bhavana into the opposite. Imagination is so, so good in here to understand, but it doesn't happen. Everyone says contemplate, think, cultivate, but imagination in the Yoga Sutra is first of all bhavana. This is my hypothesis. This is my hypothesis. And if you read Schulman's book, you see that he gives so many illustrations of the use of bhavana as imagination but in, the, in this sense of making to be, something which makes be. And then you think about that. Uh, if you think about, uh, th then I come, I've come to think of the cities as types of bhavana, 
of imagination. And I ask myself, can I imagine myself as levitating or disappearing or understanding the uh, old preacher's uh, 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 sounds? And I say, well, I cannot do that. It's a feat. It's a really feat of imagination. But this is much better in the redemption of the cities than anything else I've heard. Because then it's not something which is forced. It's a kind of capacity. It's an ability of the audience to imagine levitation. But then you ask yourself, but you don't see the world change uh, by the yogin's efforts at imagination, because bhavana is causing to be. Then what to do? But when you read the Yoga Sutra, and I'm not an expert on this, it's a new subject for me, but when you read the Yoga Sutra and Yoga Sutra Bhashya, then you see that sometimes at least the Bhashyakala does raise a question. Why doesn't the yogin change the actual world around? And this, this question can pop up in one's mind only if it does take imagination or the city as something which should be effected in the world. Now the question arises, if you read, I think about, uh, you better check me, but if you read 345, about all these cities, you know, of, you know, not, don't getting wet by, while touching water, or don't get uh, hurt by uh, standing on thorns, or, 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 or minim minimization if you become very small or very, very big. And when the, the Bhashnaka writes, really raises the question, so how, why doesn't the yogin change the world? And he says, he says something like, Shaktopi Navi Pariyasam Karoti. Although he can, he does not. But the question is, why is because... Now, this is a theory of imagination which I do not know much about it, but there is Ishvara's imagination. And you are all the great Siddha, Siddha's imagination. And you are not supposed to go against this kind of... It's imagination against imagination. This is the world. This is... I think this is why, but you, you have to check me about it, right? because I'm, I'm not 100% sure. But if you see, if you, this kind of a statement, Shaktopi Navi Pariyasam Karoti, is something which is full of meaning, because it is the yogin is capable, he can visualize, visualization is a very important word, I think visualization. I think it's not, it's not getting enough into the yoga, 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 yoga sutra, like commentaries and understand. imagination and visualization, but something which makes something true. And by the way, when I, um, I talk to, to yoga practitioners in Israel, which I've done a lot in the last year, all of them ask me the same question. How come, what is, what is actually the significance, the relevance of the Yoga Sutra to the actual yogic practice, which is especially asana and pranayama? And I, I didn't know what to say, because most of them are not interested in that. They want gymnastics, they want to be healthy, they don't want philosophy. But then I thought to myself, when I had to answer the expectations, and out of this came my thesis as actually imagination is, the Yoga Sutra is a guide for the exercise of imagination. And then I brought forth, maybe I think I'll, I'll, I'll do, thank you, Philip, for, for Stira Sukha Masana. For the Stira Sukha Masana, this is something that, which is very common among, this is the most popular <coughs> sutra for yoga practitioners. And then I tell them, you have to imagine you have, and you have to imagine the uh, asana as, let's say, stable and stable and comfortable, whatever. But it is an achievement. It's not something which is. It's not neither a statement of fact because if it had been a statement of fact, it would have been true or false. But it is not actually. Then you know what we also need in the reading the Yoga Sutra is a classification of the speech acts of the Yoga Sutra. For example, there, there, are, there are so many differences, differences among the speech. For example, if you say something like Sukha Anushayi Raga, or Dukha Anushayi Vejaha, you see statements of fact. This is, this is, it, it cannot be really, uh, if you think about it, analyze this, 
this cannot be statements of, of the, this cannot be definitions, but rather statements of fact. Sukha Nushai Ragaha. Following a moment of pleasure or experience of pleasure, there comes a attachment or something like that. And this is on following a, an experience of pain or suffering, there comes to be some aversion or dvesha out of it. This comes to be statements of facts, and the question is, another question we should uh, raise is what potentially one does with all of these, all these descriptive statements of the human condition. Why is that? Why doesn't he say just go for Kaivalya and just uh, go, it, it does that. The, the um, Diagnosis of the human condition is part and parcel of the Yoga Sutra, and it's interesting to see what, what potentially wants to do. I am I'm taking the Yoga Sutra as a skeleton. And another question which should be raised is the level of interpretation we are allowed to do. I don't want to be a New Age kind of uh, interpreter of the Yoga Sutra. But neither to think that only grammar counts. I think we should go in between somehow. And anyone can look for his own or her own way into it. Um, but uh, if you think about the power of consciousness, and of course Stephanie paid much attention, power of consciousness, it is rare in the Yoga Sutra. And uh, the power of consciousness is, first of all, I think the power of imagination, which is a very difficult discipline to follow. That's what I think. It's not just hallucination when you are in pain and you, and you dream of, of other, other, other places, other men, other, other, other moments of human condition. No, no. I think imagination in the, in the Yoga Sutra is a discipline and it's difficult. It's very, very, very difficult. And you go home and try for yourself to. to Imagine yourself disappearing, or imagine yourself levitating, etc., etc. You see how difficult it is only to imagine this, to think it's true, to feel it's true, that feel it's, it's real. It's very difficult. So that's my that's my recommendation to you. Think of of imagination in terms of bhavana, and what I need, what we need to do now is just to look for all the appearances of bhavana in the Sutra seven in number, not so little, it's something important. And also to look in other scriptures, like for example, if you look, for example, at the Bhagavad Gita, this I found out only lately. You see, is anyone does anyone own the Bhagavad Gita right now? Because it's very common people to carry this I'm sorry, yeah, you did. Look at uh, Bhagavad Gita 3.11. And 3.11 goes like this. But I, I, I'm not as focused right now. But I see 3.11 goes like this. By imagining the gods as real, by making the gods real, look, look, ima making the gods real, they make you real. Devan bhavayatanena te deva bhavayantuvaha parasparam bhavayantaha Staneshwara, thank you so very much. Everyone could hear Staneshwara. He said, no, it's, it's really, everyone had to say it again. Devan bhavayatanena te deva bhavayantuvaha parasparam bhavayantaha Three times yeah, yes. three times. Yes. But if you see, and also the following one is uh, the Yajna is the Nan Bhavita, they are made by the and Anyway, but if you really just make an experiment and, and a scholarly experiment and look at one thousand thousand translations of Bhagavad Gita three eleven and you will see the none, none of them take bhavana in its literal meaning, which is make be. You make the gods be. And Paraspanam, and they make you be. But no one, no one takes Bhavana in this sense. They say, you nourish the gods, and in, in return they nourish you. They say all these sentences, all of them. Take 1,000 translations of 3.11. Let's see, you see how the resistance to the notion of 
bhavana is making tea, imagining the gods that they, it's amazing. But you see, all of them, you see, you will laugh. You see, the 1,000, I, 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 I did look at only 890. <laughs> but you will see, you will see that there is much, so much resistance to take bhavana imagination in this Indian kind of conceptualization. And I strongly recommend David Schulman's book about the history of imagination in India and see how crucial, how central it is to this tradition. So that's why I, my the title of my presentation is now a Yoga as an Exercise of Bhavana, of Imagination in this kind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, I'm so thankful that you brought attention to 345, uh, the Basha on Sutra 345, because it's kind of infatuated me a little bit, uh, the Basha on that Sutra, because you said that um, in that the, the Bhashakara, he says that why wouldn't the yogi turn the moon into the sun and the sun into the moon? And it says because of a, a purvasita, a previously perfected one, has, has ordered things, right? Yeah. So I'm uh, curious when you said a yogi wouldn't even imagine that. You said because if you're taking this as bhavana, as imagination, and not on actually turning the moon into the sun and the sun into the moon. Right. That actually there's a kind of ethical transgression by even imagining something contrary to the imagination of Ishwara. Hmm. And I, I'm curious about that step because when, and I'm, when I read it, it seems actually quite interesting because it seems that the Bhashakara is saying that Ishwara has ordered the physical world, which seems to then touch on those creator-god kind of conversations again. Why wouldn't the yogi change the order of the world? Because it's been ordered by another. So I'd like you to talk about that, if you can, a little more about how we could feasibly read that sutra as not meaning what it seems to mean on the surface. Well, you may, thank you so much. You made me think. I've never thought deeply about it. Um, and. Um, First of all, I think that politically speaking, politically speaking, Vyasa was a conformist. He, he didn't want to change the world. Politically, I think, and uh, once upon a time I came across some of the Pashyas which looked a, bit, a little bit strange. For example, in, I think in, the, um, in Yoga Sutra uh, 133, there is a kind of a bhavana also, bhavana upon the four, four Buddhist uh, merits, yes, like uh, my tree, karuna, my tree, like uh, friend, friendship and uh, compassion and, uh, and joy and also indifference. Okay? And so in, I think in 23, there is kind of meditation upon these four qualities, Buddhist qualities. And when you read the Bhashyakara, and uh, you see this Bhashyakara says, well, um, uh, my tree is a bhavana. Is it, 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 there is any imagination possible to for bhavana, for um, uh, my tree. Also, compassion, namely karuna, is something which is his feet for imagination. And uh, uh, mudita, mudita joy, is also a bhavana. But then he says, but upeksha, indifference.